turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. As I speak about this man Solomon who was searching for answers and really searching for God. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 1. I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure. But surely this also was vanity. I said of laughter, madness, and of mirth, what does it accomplish? I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine, while guiding my heart with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants and had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possessions than herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the sons of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled, and indeed all was vanity and grasping for wind, there was no profit under the sun. Amen. When we study a book of the Bible, we want, first of all, to know who wrote it. <coughs> to whom is it written is also relevant, and why was it written? It says at the very threshold of this book, the words of the preacher. So, the author is wanting to preach. Now, I know preaching is not popular today. And even when preachers do preach, they prefer a little mini-sermon of five or ten minutes rather than serious exposition of the Word of God. But preaching has always been God's method of calling out his people. Paul said it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. It also says he's the son of David. So we find the scope narrowing here. David had some children. He was one of them. It says he was king in Jerusalem. So again, we keep narrowing it down and it certainly seems that we are focusing on the great leader of Israel, Solomon. Now, this has been disputed. I'm aware that sometimes the son of so-and-so means maybe a descendant. So, I think it's Solomon, who was a wise man, who wrote many of the Proverbs and wrote the Song of Solomon. What is Solomon doing here in this book of Ecclesiastes? It seems that Solomon here is sort of putting on the philosopher's hat. I suppose many of you, if you've gone to college, studied philosophy, which means the love of wisdom. I've studied a little philosophy. I found out one thing. There's a lot of ignorance in it because many philosophers don't believe the Bible. They believe you just figure things out on your own. But if you just try to figure things out on your own, you're like a blind man at midnight walking through an alley 
without a light. For here is the light, the light of God's word. He is writing, I believe, to show the vanity of life apart from God. And so I've called this message Searching for God. Because as we see the things that Solomon went through, the things he enjoyed, we find him experimenting, trying things out, trying to fill that vacuum of the human heart, trying to find happiness in this world. I believe a key phrase is found in verse 3 of chapter 1. If you look there quickly, you find uh, several times in this uh, book of Ecclesiastes the expression, under the sun, under the sun. And unfortunately, it's not under the S-O-N, the Son of God, but it's under the S-U-N. I believe, and I think the Old Testament is clear on this, that Solomon became backslidden for a long time in his life. He drifted away from God. He took foreign wives. In fact, he allowed even idolatry to come into his kingdom. And perhaps it was during this period in his life that he begins to think about this world, trying to figure things out, trying to find happiness, trying to find joy, trying to find satisfaction in the flesh, in pleasure, in all these different things. So in a sense, the book of Ecclesiastes is an interesting journey of the human spirit through the pathway of life under the sun, not under the S-O-N but under the S-U-N. And that is looking at things from just a human standpoint. During this time of philosophical search, it seems that Solomon is trying things out, trying to look at things at least part of the time, not from God's perspective, but as man would look at it. And that's a wonderful thing, in, in other words, in a way, because perhaps by his going through these experiences, trying to find pleasure, trying to find happiness, trying to find joy in the flesh, it will save us the problem of trying it and failing too. We as parents and, and as grandparents would like to sort of preserve our children and grandchildren from making the same mistakes we did, perhaps. And you often see a dad taking a son aside and saying, Now, son, I've been through what you're being going through. I've tried what you're trying. And let me tell you, it will break your heart. It will end in disaster. The wisdom of God would be avoid those things that will tempt you to turn away from God. And so I certainly believe that uh, the book of Ecclesiastes will be a very profitable study for you. And all I can do on Sunday morning is just hit the highlights and try to take out the germ of truth that is there. Brothers and sisters, we find, first of all, in the book of Ecclesiastes, a disillusioned man. A disillusioned man. A frustrated man. A disillusioned preacher, if you will. As I said, we know from the history of Solomon as recorded in the Kings and Chronicles that for a while he backslid. Now I want to tell you that I'm convinced that Solomon will be in heaven. Because I believe he repented of his sin, as all true Christians will. And I believe he came back to God. He was a prodigal who strayed, but came back. And let us be reminded today that a true believer can stray sometimes. A true Christian 
can turn away from the Bible and become allured with the world, with the charms, with the entanglements, with the pleasures, with what the world offers, and maybe get muddled in his or her head for a while. And so if you have a loved one, if you know someone who made a loud profession of faith, and stood in church and said, I've come to Jesus. And maybe even was baptized. And you see that person drifting away into something besides the truth of God. Be careful you don't write them off. Pray for them. Time may show that they were never really converted. But time may also show that they drifted temporarily. After all, you know, we, we read about Peter denying the Lord for a while when he was in a time of pressure and temptation. The disillusionment of the preacher Solomon was over the fact that life was so frustrating to him. And in the second chapter, part of which I read a moment ago, we find Solomon trying out all these things. He tried out pleasure, first of all. In verse 1, he says, Come now, I will test you with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. Now, life has many pleasures. There's fun, there's frolic, there's frivolity out there. And, of course, the devil wants us all to think this is what life is all about. Go from one thing to another, trying to have fun. And there's nothing wrong with fun. I've had plenty of fun in my life. But that should not be the ultimate goal. Sensual pleasure. I'm sure that although he does not mention it here, that part of this was sexual pleasure. For Solomon had a whole bunch of wives. And being the king, he could get any wife he wanted. He could take the fairest, the most beautiful virgins in the land, bring them into his palace, have them powdered and painted and pampered so that they could be his consorts. And so he went after pleasure. And we're told in the Kings and Chronicles how he did that. But when it was all said and done, as he'd given himself up to these lusts, what does he say at the end of it all? It's vanity. It's vanity. Now, we have today all these temptations in this direction. And this is a kind of world we live in. We can't get away from it. No matter how we, hard we try, our children, our grandchildren, are going to be tempted to live together before they get married. They're going to be tempted to think, oh, well, if I use condoms, it's okay, as long as I don't get pregnant. Because after all, God gave me these hormonal drives. Why not express them? And yet how many people there are who down the road, especially women, who've given in to the temptations of the flesh and have listened to the carnal demands of men, have looked at their lives and have said, why did I allow this to happen? I'm hurt. I'm ruined. I'm like an orange peeling that's thrown away. And even Solomon said it's vanity. He also enjoyed prosperity. Verses 4 through 7. He was king. He was wealthy. He could get anything he wanted. And so we're told here he gives a litany of his indulgences. I made my works great. I built houses. I planted vineyards. I made gardens. I planted fruit trees. I made water pools and growing trees of the grove. I had servants, male and female servants, born in my house. I had flocks. I had herds. And in Solomon's day, these were the criteria of success. Oh, success. What a snare it can be. 
We're a success-oriented generation. We love to see people succeed, and we sort of look down on people who fail. Our sports heroes are our heroes as long as they win. But if the coach loses a few games, out, sir, we can't tolerate losing. We want success in business. We want success in religion. And sometimes at the expense even of truth and serious worship. All the temptations are great. Well, Solomon had all these things. But after accumulating, after adding all these things to his lives and indulging himself, surrounding himself with servants, men servants, maid servants, with his gardens, with his pools, with his palaces, with all the things that life could offer. He suddenly comes down to the end and he sees nothing but the debris of his own folly. And so he says, sadly, it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. It's grasping for the wind. The story is told of a prospector during the 1840s who got that lust for gold. And he sold his house in the east and he went across the plains in his Conestoga wagon and he dedicated himself to finding gold in the hills of California. He starved himself. He worked himself to the bone. He got up early. He stayed up late and ruined his health looking for gold, looking for gold, panhandling in the streams. And finally one day his, he was an old man. His health was gone. He was dying. And he looked and there it was, the gold, the glittering gold. He was dying though and he wrote in the sand, I died rich. And some of his friends came the next day and found that the gold was not really gold. It was iron pyrites, fool's gold. He died a fool. He thought he had it all. He thought he died rich, but he died poor. And oh, how the devil deceives us and fools us into thinking by striving for that which this world can offer, we can find happiness, but... Solomon found it brings vanity and vexation of spirit in the end. He also enjoyed power, verse 9. He says, Here that he was eminent in his power because he became so great in the eyes of man. He says, So I became great. I became great. He was an ambitious individual. Of course, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth because he was the son's king. And he wanted to get to the top. He wanted to be number one. So he became great. No one was greater than Solomon. People came from all over the world to see his wisdom and his riches. The queen of Sheba came... And the Bible says it took her breath when he saw the glory of his kingdom. Here was this gold temple... Luxury spilled and oozed out of his life. He became what he wanted to be. He became great. Does power bring success? Yes. But power too can be a snare. Power can lead us from God. Lust for power can cause us to compromise. Lust for success can cause us to turn away from what we know to be right. Lust for success and power can cause us to cheat and lie and cut corners. And 
when it was all said and done, it's all grasping for the wind. He also enjoyed popularity, verse 9. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. What a reputation he had. And yet, even his popularity did not really meet the need of his heart. The applause, you know, the applause of people, what a snare that is. And it's a snare in even in religion. We want to meet people's approval. We want to be successful. We want to have the bigger church. We want to, to have more friends. Do you know something? The smiles of the crowd won't amount to a lot at the day of judgment. It speaks in the Old Testament about God's commandment not to follow a multitude to do evil. Oh, everybody's doing it. Okay, sure, everybody's doing it. Everybody was doing it in Jesus' day. And he said, the way is straight and narrow and few there be that find it. Not only did Solomon enjoy popular pleasure, prosperity, power, and popularity, but he enjoyed perception. Because verse 9 says his wisdom remained with him. And this is another reason I'm convinced this was, in fact, Solomon. Because he was known as a wise man. And God gave him wisdom. This was a God-given gift. He could understand riddles. He studied philosophy. He studied botany. He studied science. And for his day, he was advanced. I'm sure he encompassed the whole field of human wisdom. And you know, the brain is exalted today, isn't it? And some strive to get all these, you know, advanced degrees and so forth. And think that that will fill the vacuum of their heart. And that will bring them to heaven. But it won't. Sometimes God, you know, just contradicts all the motives of men. And God could uh, pass up a, someone with a eloquent voice or maybe a lot of education and maybe raise up a D.L. Moody who just butchered the king's English and yet he got up and spoke plain sermons and thousands were converted. Had to be careful about this. He became a student of philosophy. Verse 12, I turned myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. But that too was vanity and vexation of spirit. And I want to tell you, folk, today a wisdom of the world that doesn't have Christ in it is just froth. If Jesus Christ is not the center of your education, if Jesus Christ is not your primary search, it will end you, it will bring you to a, a one-way street, it will take you into a blind alley, it will cause you to jump off the bridge of despair. But... Praise God, the story doesn't end here. And we come to the second point, and that is the delivered preacher. We have a disillusioned preacher, but now we have also a delivered preacher because it seems that although this sort of uh, disillusionment runs clear through the book of, of Ecclesiastes, we find as he comes toward the end, things begin to clear up. We find the fog beginning to clear a little bit. And I think, and this is my view, that we find in Ecclesiastes the story of Solomon's beginning to return back to God. I want to tell you now something, and, and I, I know that this is a theological issue, and I know that, that uh, a lot of people don't agree with me on this, but I don't think a Christian, a true believer, can lose his or her salvation. The reason I they don't think that is because we're saved by grace. Inevitably, the churches that preach you can lose your salvation are going to wind up in works for salvation eventually. Because they say, you know, we have to keep ourselves by our works. We have to keep ourselves by what we do. And if we stumble, if we fall, then God's going to throw us into hell. But Jesus said, 
they shall never perish. Whosoever believeth shall never perish. But I also believe that the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart of the Christian. And this is written in our uh, doctrinal statements in our church. This is a cornerstone of grace. If we're saved by our free will and our works, then we're in constant danger. We're, we're skating on thin ice all the time. I also believe there's another side to it. And sometimes, you know, how many times have you heard people say, well, if I believe like you did, then, you know, I just go out and sin all I want. I'll go to heaven anyway. Now, hold it. The same God who forgives me and gives me eternal life puts his spirit in my heart so that I will be kept from finally turning away from him. That's the flip side of it. So those who are kept by grace will also continue eventually to walk on the path and get to heaven because holiness is essential as an evidence of grace. And that's the part sometimes the Baptists leave out. Solomon comes back as he thinks, first of all, about judgment. In chapter 11, verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. For know that all these, for all these, God will bring you into judgment. Now this man's beginning to think straight. He's been the philosopher. He's tried all these experimentations. He's had prosperity and power and pleasure and perception and all the rest. And now he's beginning to think, wait a minute. There's a reckoning. There's an accountability. And so he comes back to the fact of judgment. This people don't want today, though, do they? No, no. All they want to have is two inches of the love of God smeared over everybody. God loves everybody. There's no wrath. There's no judgment. That's not Bible. That may make the unsaved uncomfortable. But that's just too bad. It's true. There's judgment. In fact, that's why Jesus Christ went to the cross, to save us from judgment. Also, we find Solomon here challenging youth to remember their creator. And I almost, I just have a feeling that as he wrote this, his heart was full of guilt over the fact that he missed many of his opportunities. Down in chapter 12, verse 1, Remember now your creator. In the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Oh, there's, such, there's, there's, there's beauty in these young people in our church who are yielding their lives to God and are following the Lord. In believers' baptism. And I see joy in their faces. I see happiness. But I see hardness and rebellion in those who do not want the Bible any longer. Who don't want to go to Sunday school and study the Bible. They want to have their ears tickled with maybe something more fancy. Also, Solomon takes a dose of reality in chapter 12, verse 7. And reminds us that our spirits aren't going to be in the body here on earth forever. He says in verse 7, Then the dust, the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. That's chapter 12, verse 7. On Friday we put one of God's children into the earth. And this was a verse that I, that I used at the graveside. The dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to the God who gave it. That's going to happen if Jesus tarries. That's going to happen unless he comes and you're caught up, raptured to meet him. So that dose of reality, you know, sometimes a dose of reality is good for you. You know that? Sometimes we have, to, we have to drink the cup of reality. 
And one dose is you're not going to live forever. You're not going to be married forever. You're not going to have your house forever. You're not going to wear those clothes forever. You're not going to drive those cars forever. For your spirit will return into God who gave it. Now, finally, Solomon recognizes that when it's all said and done, fearing God and keeping his commandments is what really works and what's really important. Look in verse 13 of chapter 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. And uh, I don't know, I just have a feeling when Solomon said this, he thought to himself, I wish I had lived up to it myself. The fear of God and keeping his commandments is what keeps you straight. Pleasing the Lord, knowing God. Walking with God. Standing for God. That's what's important in the end. Now, we come to the, just a couple of minutes about lessons for modern man. You and I will never have the opportunities the preacher had. You and I will never have the pleasures, the prosperity, the power that Solomon had. At least I don't think so. I don't think any of you here will ever have the privileges he had. So let us profit from his experience. Let us learn that apart from God, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Under the sun, it's vanity. Under the sun, from a human standpoint, life is stupid. You know, the philosopher Nietzsche said, who didn't believe in God, life is a joke. And that's what they're teaching a lot of people today. We're just descended from monkeys anyway. And we're going to wind up in a tomb. And nothing we, we, nothing we do or say is going to keep us alive forever. So life is just a big joke. Let's just have fun and die. And, and you know, do all these fun things and so forth. If we can read Ecclesiastes ourselves. And not go through this frustration and disillusionment. It will save us a lot of problems. And so... Solomon searches for God, going through all these pleasures, power, and, and the rest, and he winds up in the right place at the throne of God. Oh, brothers and sisters, there's only one safe place, and that's at the cross. There's only one safe place, and that's at the throne of God. Learn from someone else's experience. Learn that the search for happiness must end in God's word or it will never end at all.